Good afternoon and welcome again to this webinar series on the crisis of democracy. For today's session, we have Marta Fraile, who is Senior Research Fellow at the CSIC, the Spanish National Research Council, where she also co-directs the Institute for Public Goods and, and Policies, the IPP. Her research uh, focuses on the study of political participation and public opinion, which she analyzes from a comparative perspective and a gender approach. Her work has been published in the British Journal of Political Science, the European Journal of Political Research, or the International Political Science Review, among others. Welcome to this webinar series, Marta, and thank you for your presence today. I think that your presentation on the gender backlash will be very interesting and it will help us to deal with a dimension of populism that is less discussed in, in public debate. So without further delay, I give you the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to participate in this seminar series. It's really a pleasure for me. And um, today I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the many challenges uh, that democracies are currently facing. Of course, it's a challenge that is directly related to other challenges that have been discuss it um, in this series. It's about uh, gender inequalities. However, I would also like in this uh, presentation to transcend uh, the topic of gender uh, to uh, backlash politics more in general. Now, uh, my main argument today will be that um, for years we have uh, implicitly assumed that in our societies, gender equality will develop in a linear way. That is to say, in progression, in continuous progression, and without setbacks. However, the current situation suggests that uh, this is no longer the case, and that perhaps we are attending a crucial societal development um, of uh, anti-genderism, or even gender resentment. During the following minutes, I would like to bring you to the discussion of uh, what is uh, backlash politics and what are the main strategies that are used in the context of backlash politics. I will then discuss the possible causes and explanations of the emergence and development of uh, backlash politics with an explicit reference to gender. Finally, I would like to propose you a kind of um, exercise of imagination uh, about how the future could be with respect to backlash politics and uh, democracy. So let me start with gender equality. Where are we now? Well, decades of uh, uh, policy efforts and campaigns by governments, by international organizations, by social movements have brought uh, significant progress uh, in women's economic and social uh, status, and of course political status, around the world. And this is even more obvious in Europe. This is because Europe uh, has the European Union, which is an institution that uh, remains a driving force uh, in its commitment to gender equality. Now, having said that, uh, the goal of gender equality, however, uh, remains still largely out of reach. And this is clearly illustrated by recent evidence that has been collected by the European Institute for Gender Equality. The European Institute for Gender Equality has been created by the European Union, uh, and it has been working now around one decade, more or less. Um, and they have constructed what they call the index of gender equality in different societies. 
the approach that this institute uh, proposed is an intersecting approach in which they try to figure out the level of gender equalities in very different dim dimensions of societies. So they, in this index, they include information ab about uh, very different uh, dimensions. And I'm going to enumerate all of them. The dimension of work, which measures the extent to which women and men can benefit from equal access to employment and good working conditions. The second dimension is the dimension of money and measures gender inequalities in access to financial resources and women and men's economic situation. Then there is uh, the dimension of knowledge, which is really important, and uh, it measures gender inequalities in educational attachment, attainment, sorry, and uh, also in participation in education and training over the life course and gender segregation in the fields in which men and women um, obtain education. Then we've got the dimension of time, which measures gender inequalities in the allocation of time spent doing care and domestic work on the one hand and social activities on the other. Then we have the dimension of power, which is also very important, which measures gender equality in decision-making positions across three different spheres. The political sphere, and this is measured through um, numbers showing the representation of women in national, regional, and local um, assemblies. Then also in the economic realm, measuring women's presence on corporate boards and national banks. And finally, social sphere, uh, such as, for example, the participation of women in um, research funding organizations or the presence of women in media and sports. Finally, there is also a dimension of health, which measures gender equality in three health-related aspects, such as health status, health behavior, and access to health services. Now, with all this information, they have created this gender equality index, and the range of variation of the index goes from 1 to 100. And of course, 100 will mean effective gender equality. Now, what is the, the, the number now no, of this index? Here you can see the distribution of, of the value of the index of gender equality across countries in Europe. And as you can see, there is much variation across countries. The average number is uh, almost 68 hmm, for all Europe, which gives you an idea about the level of gender equality, hmm. but gives you also the idea that we are still far away from reaching hmm, total equality. There is much room for improvement. Um, we also see that in this huge variation across countries, we can find like the group of champions of uh, gender equality, which will be, of course, Scandinavian countries like Sweden or Finland or Denmark, which present levels of gender equality higher than 70 points. And uh, of course, we have also at the bottom um, those countries where gender inequalities are higher, or the index is smaller. And I'm talking about countries that you see at the bottom, uh, such as East and Central European countries, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Slovakia. Uh, but also, and remarkably, we've got Greece, hmm? showing a very low level of gender equality around 52. 
but uh, apart from this cross-country variation, which is in itself an interesting uh, finding, um, I would like to focus here more on the evolution of the gender equality index across time. And uh, the first thing I wanted to point is the fact that the evolution of gender equality is slow. Here in the, in the figure, you see the, com the comparison of three different points in time of the index. And as you can see, there is room for improvement, as we said before, but also uh, the gender equality index score has increased only by around four points since 2010, which uh, is the first point in time available, and um, only by half point since 2017. So all of this suggests that at this pace of progress, which is more or less one point every two years, it will take more than 60 years to achieve gender equality. And we're talking about the European Union, which is supposed to be the paradise in terms of gender equality. Now, gender inequalities are most marked in the domain of power, which is around 53 points, especially in economic decision making. The second lowest score is located in the domain of knowledge and um, gender segregation in tertiary education appears to be like one of the main obstacles. In this evolution, there is also a warning point, and is the evidence, small but very telling, of a step backwards. Since 2010, the score has decreased in the domain of time by more than one point, with, uh, uh, remember that this, this uh, domain measures the distribution of housework and caring responsibilities. Um, the impression that I have and everybody has, of, co of course, is that these inequalities might be growing in the, present in the face of the present COVID pandemic, where we've got children at home and uh, their responsibilities are unbalanced. Now, as I was mentioning before, we're talking about the paradise in terms of gender equality, no? which is uh, Europe. What happened around the world? Well, things are even worse. The most recent report of uh, human developed perspective also shows that uh, progress towards gender equality is slowing down around the world. So, in few words, the world now is not on track to achieve gender equality anytime soon. Now, it is true, you know, in the first lecture of this series, Professor Vallespin uh, referred to what we have gained and what we have lost you know, uh, during the last uh, decades in uh, democracy. Well, in the case of gender, it is clear that we have gained it a lot. Gender inequalities have remarkable decreased during the last decades. For instance, today in the developed world, women are better off than ever, this is true. But in the developing world, all too often women and girls are discriminated against in health, in education, at home, in the labor market, and this has negative implications for their freedoms in general. So again, and as usual, the battle is half full, half, half empty um, in comparison to 50 years ago, but uh, it is clear that there is room for improvement. And uh, I think that the, the most uh, relevant point for improvement are the double shift at home, the harassment in public transportation, the discrimination in workplaces, and the multiple hidden obstacles that uh, women constantly need to face in their daily life, and that often are silent, but they are there. Uh, 
Uh, and I'm talking not only about the developing world, but also the developed world. Okay, so as a reaction of these uh, perceptions of the need to improve, new social movements have appeared and are emerging all around the world. Different forms of demonstrations, including online campaigns, women's marches, street performances, they are all demanding today new ways of looking at gender equality and women empowerment. For example, I have just illustrated some examples of this. Um, the recent wave of highly visible protest against sexual harassment, the Me Too, or the mobilization of women in Latin America, such as Argentina, or Chile, or Mexico, no? Or the I Will Go Out uh, movement in India, demanding equal rights for women in public spaces. So, on the one hand, we've got this mobilization, we've got this consciousness about the need to improve uh, gender equality, but then, in parallel to this, we've got also um, a counter wave of mobilization against gender equality. So conservative and populist voices in many democracies are now contesting the equal participation of men and women in society under the umbrella of what has been called the war on gender ideology or against UPT women or arrogant women, no? I'm sure that you, you are familiar with this uh, sentence. Mm. So, um, when we think about populist, uh, when we think about uh, um, leaders such as Trump or Bolsonaro or Urban, Salvini, Moraviecki, uh, Abascal in Spain, no? Uh, immediately, in the top of our minds, uh, we think about immigration, or we think about nationalism, no? Italian first, or uh, Spaniard first, first. However, they also share something, and what they share is their anti-genderism frame. They all use gender to discredit the prior political order and to validate the one they are offering. And the one they are offering or they claim for is one which wishes to come back to the past, wishes to put women in their natural place, the place in which they will be happier, and uh, they wish to restore the traditional gender order. But let us reflect a little bit more about backlash politics more in general. So here I'm gonna follow a recent article by Alter and Zoom in which they reflect about um, the main characteristics of um, uh, backlash politics and which could be the fundamental ingredients defining backlash politics. And here I'm gonna speak about three main ingredients for the prescription of backlash politics. The first one is a retrograde objective of recovering the past. The second is the challenge of existing dominant scripts. And the third is this threshold condition of entering mainstream political discourse. Let us elaborate a little bit each of the three ingredients. Now, the first ingredient is, to me at least, is the most important. is this idea that backlash is retrograde. And it's retrograde because it aims to restore a prior social condition. And this prior social condition normally is evoked with a kind of nostalgia. So, returning to a prior condition is, is crucial to define backlash because uh, its aim is to achieve a different social uh, order. 
and not merely to reverse or to fight against one specific poli policy. Okay, they want more. Retrograde aspirations might gain an extensive dynamic in the course of backlash politics. It has this potentiality, and this is dangerous. In the case of gender, the retrograde in insight is related to this idea of coming back to the times when the family was the primary unit of society. Or in words of uh, right-wing populist, maintaining the centrality of the natural family in societies goes against the cultural imperialist mission that imposes radical feminism. End of the quote. So this with respect to the retrograde objective. The second ingredient is that backlash involves goals that challenge dominant or main street views. Um, this is important because often we think that uh, uh, it is enough with the existence of a movement that goes against a specific policy, for example, abortion in the case of uh, women, no? Uh, but there is something more. So they challenge shared principles, they challenge procedures, and they challenge practices within which political processes and the exercise of political authority tend to occur in democratic normality. So backlash politics see the status quo situation as deficient, and so there is the aspiration and also the urgency to change these existing norms, these existing processes and outcomes. And of course, all of this involves the reconstitution of the political sphere. Now, of course, different backlash mm, agendas will, will uh, reject different aspects no, of dominant uh, scripts. For example, uh, in Europe, today's populist backlash movements seek to roll back immigration, that will be one of them, or decrease or even eliminate the delegation of power to um, European institutions, or in the case of gender, the return to a more traditional gender role. Now, the third condition is this idea of um, play a role in public discourses. So to successfully communicate the retrograde imaginary in the public, a threshold condition is to get access to mainstream media, to get access to social media, and of course to arrive to parliaments. Because this is the way they have to voice their discourse, to voice their plans, to voice their um, retrograde message. Now, I'm not going to elaborate this more because Professor Martinez Vascuñan, one week ago, was speaking about this, about uh, how backlash politics have entered the media and how they challenge many things um, using media to their favor, um, especially because a lot of, I mean, um, many of the styles they have um, are very... Um, popular uh, and uh, can generate a kind of a toxic dependency, you know, because it's, it's something that uh, creates audiences. Okay, but having said that, and it was already discussed, so this is another kind of challenge, I would also like to um, discuss uh, the style, you know, that this um, backlash politics uh, uh, half. Uh, I call it here are the relevant companions no, of these ingredients. Um, I would like to discuss uh, the emotive elements that they use. Um, this is strategy of breaking taboos and using new political strategies. 
that sometimes are presented as really new and breaking, but uh, if you think about it carefully, they're old. Then finally, um, the challenge uh, that they make to procedures and institutions from dominant politics. Okay, so let's uh, see each of them. Mm, regarding emotive elements, um, normally they are presented using this kind of fog of nostalgia, no? It's everything a little bit mixed. And um, I am referring here to emotional appears that have the capacity to mobilize people. And uh, they have this capacity because they tend to generate intense feelings, intense sentiments. These feelings, of course, tend to be negative and take the form of resentment to those who somehow are guilty of having contributed to create the established social order. Of course, of course these tend to be social groups that are identified with a kind of an elite. Hmm? The second um, companion is taboo breaking and new political strategies. So to wake up people from a tacit support of dominant beliefs, it requires a break. This break usually implies the rejections of some institutions, uh, the rejections of some norms, as because they are politically correct, but they are, you know, nothing. They are weak. Mm, and uh, sometimes even mm, the rejection of a specific groups of people, because they are here, you know, just to get benefits from themselves, but nothing else, like groups of women, feminists, or homosexual. Um, in general, mm, the logic of taboo breaking is disruptive and is also very aggressive because this transmits a feeling of power. Finally, mm, challenge to procedures and institutions that are associated with the mainstream power. And here, the more transformative the retrograde vision is, the larger the aspiration of social change. And the more core principles and institutions of the mainstream are challenged, of course. Okay, so I think with these elements, we, we ha I have tried to discuss a little bit uh, um, all the main characteristics no, of uh, backlash politics. Let us uh, now change and speak about the causes of uh, backlash politics. And of course, here I'm not going to be very original, and many of them have been already discussed in prior sessions. So I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more uh, the one that is more directly linked to gender. So in previous sessions, uh, one of the causes of, of um, backlash politics has been discussed, which is uh, socioeconomic changes producing a specific groups of losers. Then last week, uh, it was discussed also this idea of cultural changes and the challenge of traditions. And what I'm going to discuss today is um, demographic changes and the decline of the male breadwinner family mode. Okay, so... Gender equality and economic competition with women represent a relevant change to society so that many people, and especially older, working class, white men, 
feel resentful reacting against this idea that gender equality is racism. This is because men, as the traditionally dominant group in society, perceive or tend to perceive gains um, in the status of women occurring at the expense of men. No, as if uh, this will be a zero sum game. So if women are getting better, this is because we are getting worse. No, so this is the logic. So when patriarchal structures are threatened by increasing women uh, presence in politics or by the implementation of policies that are designed to remedy discrimination, then a rise on reactionary anti-feminist attitudes can occur. Now this has been, uh, or, or this is more a speculation than anything. It has not been, you know, truly demonstrated. We need data to demonstrate this. Uh, but the field is developing and many different surveys, international surveys are uh, trying to incorporate questions that try to measure the extent to which there are people who really think this way, who really um, have this kind of gender resentment. Now, why this occurs? Well, let me rescue a very old concept, which is the concept of intrusiveness by Wallach uh, from the 60s. Um, according to this concept, minorities may be viewed as um, non-threatening, and uh, maybe usually or easily accepted uh, in environments where the numbers are still low. But as the number of minority increases, majority groups may perceive this as a threat to their dominance. So this may be happening. Gender-based resentment is the belief that men are discriminated against while women receive a special treatment or favoritism. This is because governments all around the world uh, prioritize the distribution of resources to women. So this logic has been called hostile sexism, which is a kind of uh, sexism. And um, this logic can be also adopted not only by men, but also by other women. For example, white, low-income women um, who sees the, this kind of uh, progressive women uh, challenging their own role as mothers uh, in traditional uh, families. According to Faludi, uh, who was one of the first in using this concept of backlash, um, Backlasher commonly blamed women's progress for causing all these ugly things. Female burnout, infertility epidemics, emasculation of women, neglected children, and in general, moral collapse. Of course, all these social, cultural, and political ch change do not necessarily will precipitate backlash. But um, it is also true that uh, we are, now we are seeing that uh, many groups use strategically all those changes. They use them uh, to their own interest. And they often manipulate arguments in a very cynic way. Um, and they play also upon human fears and human concerns. Hmm? And uh, just to give you an example about uh, the kind of uh, manipulation that uh, radical right-wing parties, for example, no? as an example of backlash, can make, um, let me open a footnote here. Um, there is this uh, uh, funny, but not so funny, in reality, it's cynic manipulation of um, right-wing parties with uh, uh, gender equality. 
because it is useful for their own strategy, electorally. For example, the, the Front National in France, or the FPO in Austria, they have gradually appropriated discourse on women's rights and feminist slogans for their own discourses about Islam or about immigration more generally. And this also has happened in Sweden and in the Netherlands. Um, let me quote Marie Le Pen uh, in 2016. She said, I am worried that the migrant crisis signals the beginning of the end of women's rights. End of the quote. Of course, it is obvious no, that the promotion of women's rights by radical right-wing parties uh, is not linked to, to a profound ideological commitment. No? But they use them. They use them to their, to their own favor because they think it's a good way to legitimize uh, a political discourse um, such as racist or xenophobic claims. No? So rather than presenting them as a xenophobic discourse, they use uh, gender equality as an argument uh, to, to get the support of people. OK, I close the fourth note here. Um, now let me propose you an exercise of imagination. How can things change in the future? And what will be the different scenarios that we can uh, find? It is, of course, a very difficult um, exercise. But there are like three possible scenarios. The first one is dissipation. There is no change. Despite all the challenges, at the end, nothing happens. The second is major change. And the third is we get social setback. OK, so let's discuss um, each of these scenarios briefly. <laughs> um, the scenario of no change um, is, is one in which backlash politics decline or dilute to finally disappear or to remain something anecdotic or residual. Uh, and this could happen for many different reasons. For example, the most obvious could be um, a context in which uh, an, an, an unexpected event occurs, such a um, natural disaster, or even a pandemic, no? as the one we're suffering now. Um, or it might be that after some time, the leaders of these movements reveal their true power-seeking mm, nature, and so they decide to disclaim their, their priorities and their constituency uh, once they have arrived to power, which was the thing that they were interested in at the end of the day. Mm? So it might be one possibility. The second possibility, and we are getting some examples, unfortunately, that this is happening, is one of relevant change. So backlash politics can generate a new social cleavage that becomes a permanent feature of democratic or even authoritarian politics. So this will imply um, significant changes in specific policies at all levels of government, regional, national, even international. And we have seen that, no? Uh, recently with um, some international organizations, how they, ha they have been challenged. Um, but this will not reshape uh, the national political system, or at least not completely. Uh, and as I was mentioning before, we, we, we find some examples of uh, worrisome backslide, backsliding um, in gender equality performance. In, in some countries uh, from the East and from Central Europe, like Hungary or Poland. Hmm? Finally, the last scenario, which will be the worst one, is um, one of social reversion. And this will imply a more radical transformation of the political realm. And 
this major transformation will bring um, a different social order with uh, new taboos, perhaps new heroes, uh, a different uh, script, uh, and, and a kind of reorganization of society. Examples of this will be for um, the return to an Islamic state, or the return to socialist parties uh, and principles, no? like in Russia, for example. This has been you know, mentioned uh, in, by pundits in, uh, and has been speculated. Of course, in all these three scenarios, uh, we will have counter mobilizations, no? and, and, and their strategies will be very relevant to determine uh, the future of backlash politics, no? and the extent to which it has the, pot the potential to, to, to reshape societies and to create such big change. No? So, of course, counter mobilization is, is something relevant, and we have seen also examples of counter mobilizations in, in some countries. Just to give you an example, uh, the mobilization of women in Poland against uh, the abolition of uh, abortion, for example, will be one, uh, one of them. Who knows what can happen? No, it's, it's really difficult to, to, to know. Uh, it's true no, that, um, or, or I hope no, the, at this point, uh, that may happen like in um, this novel, no? uh, El Gato Pardo, uh, uh, Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, no? when uh, John Tancredi uh, was talking to his senior uncle, uh, the Prince of Salina, Fabrizio, no? and, and he said to him, listen, we need to support the rebels. We need to support Garibaldi to assure that things will remain the same in Sicily. Okay, so it might be, you know, that like um, backlash politics end up being no more than a cynic, ugly change that only aims that everything remains the same. Or as the novel says in original language, se vogliamo che tutto rimanga come, bisogna che tutto cambie. Okay, I think I can stop here and open the floor for discussion. Thank you very much. For that attention. Thank you very much, Ma uh, Marta. Marvelous ending. <clears throat> uh, marvelous ending, indeed. Um, yes, we have some some questions already, but I I I, I have one that I, I can't miss, you know, because when whenever someone um, presents several possibilities as being all relevant in order to point to the causes of why. Why uh, has this um, this backlash been produced? Um, I don't know why, but I, I always want to know which of the causes you would favor. So, which do you think? Because I know Pipa Norris and, and, and others favor mostly the cultural dimension, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and, and, and for them, it's, it's a way of explaining the, uh, I mean, why, why this, why this, uh, uh, I mean, the success of, of, of strong men, of populists. And, and their discourse goes more or less like this. Um, academic, journalistic, and leftist elites have always been more progressive than the average American. Mm -hmm. Therefore, hmm, now things return to where they should have been, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really buy that idea, but, um, but I think it has its force, right? Because I think it's one of the arguments that populists themselves are using in order to defend their position regarding women's rights or the emancipation of women, you know, if we want to return to, to more drastic expression, right? So, so um, I think the other one, the socioeconomic dimension is, is quite relevant because I think it is, uh, is indeed a you know, a fact that women are competing with men everywhere. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not as it used to be even 20 years ago, I would say, right? So at least if you look at the academic realm or, or, um, or um, <clears throat> within, within corporations. Uh, so in that sense, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know which, which of the vectors to give more force than, than the other, right? So I wanted to know your opinion on mm. that. 
Okay. Thank you. And then we'll, we'll pass to the, to the audience. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, I also agree with you that um, the cultural uh, explanation is um, sexy, but at the same time, it's a little bit uh, American-oriented, I think. Mm. Yeah. And perhaps mm. it's, it travels with more difficulties in the case of Europe. Mm. And um, uh, the socioeconomic argument, perhaps it has more uh, weight. You know, at, at this point, I think, that I remember some years ago, I, I read this book by Spin Anderson, who is not considered no, no. a great no. feminist, no? no, no. But um, this uh, book is The Incompleted Revolution, adapting welfare states to the changing women's roles. And um, the main argument he was making there was interesting because his argument was that um, all this transformation, since women decided to get to the labor market, uh, is producing a lot of consequences. Mm. And these consequences um, create new unbalanced situations in the family, outside the family. Um, and he was arguing that the lack of response or, 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 or a response that is very slow from the welfare state uh, is dangerous because you cannot maintain a society in, in this unbalanced way for a long time. Mm. So this will be an, an alternative explanation, I think. No, yeah. This idea that, uh, um, you know, our social, uh, no, our, our personal bi biographies um, are not any longer uh, they used to be. And uh, the role of family, which is, you remember, no, Marx was one of those yeah, telling that the family is like the most conservative family, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, institution in society, yeah, yeah. no? Mm -hmm. So um, if there are many models of family, uh, then this strength in, you know, getting people order in society uh, will be lost. So I tend to think that uh, perhaps this idea of, uh, because the welfare state was in, during the 60s, uh, was a source of peace and richness and wealth no, for societies. And it was created very much on the shoulders of women. No? And they were based on a role, on a specific role of women. When this role has completely changed, um, many things are moved. Mm. Uh, so of course, this cannot be considered in isolation because this goes with globalization, it's, this goes with uh, many other things, no? But uh, I tend to see more weight to this, uh, or, or perhaps that we haven't thought enough about yeah. this. Yeah, I think that's absolutely um, like that. I mean, it's, it's certain, I mean, it, we haven't thought about it at all, I would say, right? So, mm. Because the, you know, the social democratic uh, consensus was based mainly on on the head of the family, the male as the as a bread bringer, right, and, mm -hmm. and 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 her her wife, you know, uh, taking care of the children and of the household. I mean, that was almost standardized, right? But don't you think that uh, returning to the cultural, to to the backlash idea, because I think it's you know maybe it's because I'm I'm an academic, you know, and and, and I'm interested in and I'm political theorist. Don't you think that this hubris of new feminist discourses that we can see in, in let's say, in mainstream academic feminism, right, mm -hmm. have entered into the, into the uh, for instance, Spain, I think it's a fact, have entered into the, into the public discussion, right? And so, in, in, and, and, and that they somehow distort hmm, mm -hmm. the, previous, the, the previous reflections on, on, on women's rights so that people don't really know what it, what it is about at the mm. moment, right? So mm -hmm. w what does it mean to defend women, right? Uh, mm -hmm. do, do we have a, no a clear notion of what it means? Mm. Or, um, I mean, um, so it's, it's um, LGTB or whatever, right? Mm. So everything's mixed up. And so in the end, well, that's my personal impression, in the end, so the ordinary citizen doesn't really know what it is about, and it is a marvelous chance for the extreme right to profit from that. Yeah. Because they can make, they can make an, an, an incredibly uh, demagogic discourse. Mm. Because, I mean, I mean, they don't represent the, the mainstream of the feminist tradition or even feminist discourse. And so they mix everything 
And to them, I think it's great because because it's it's a way to connect with people, mainly, for instance, ordinary Catholics who don't understand anything anymore, mm -hmm. then they find identified with, with those people. At least that, that's what happened in Spain. Don't you think it's something like that? Mm. Yeah, well, the, I think that the division of um, uh, what is the um, uh, women interest and how can it be, you know, defended and uh, developed and, and, and progress is clear that uh, when you divide, uh, then you lose. Um, at the theoretical level, yeah, I think that, that that's quite difficult to, to get mm. at the, yeah, for, for the average uh, citizen. Mm. And um, I mean, the role of theory in the, um, developing this idea of um, a more dynamics uh, gender, no, a fluid concept mm. of gender in which uh, it doesn't matter this, uh, whether it is uh, men or women, uh, is really, really blurring and uh, it's difficult, very difficult to, to understand. So, yeah, probably uh, linking these two social movements in the streets uh, is also problematic because um, mm, the discourse is not very well understood. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a very sophisticated um, mm. theory. Mm. So, it's very difficult to summarize it in, in, in a slogan. It's absolutely true, yeah. yeah. So that, that's the main uh, complication, yeah. I think. Uh, so perhaps uh, there should be a kind of, um, of, a stra of a, or we need a kind of a strategy to simplify things and to make them more pedagogical yeah. so that uh, you, can, you, you can explain more with more calm, with more, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, like, uh, what I perceive right now is, is, is a kind of, of, a kind of con continuous fight, uh, very aggressive, and in this context it is impossible to explain uh, no, the contents of something that is so yeah. sophisticated. No, as it's a struggle, uh, a struggle for hegemony, really, within the movement, hmm. and, and that's too bad for the, for the movement somehow. Yeah, I absolutely, think, yeah. yeah. Mm. That's a problem. Mm. Okay, thank you, Marta. We have some questions. Here goes one. Um, we are assisting today. Here was Javier Mendez. What's it? We are assisting today the Hollywood industry of a, a model of female which points to the male predominant role. Strong, self-confident, violent women. Don't you think that that it is a case of backlash politics? The role of uh, yeah, strong, you know, and you know, a, a woman that's presented like you know, a, a male. You know, in, in, in many Hollywood movies, you know, they know how to fight and they know, they know how to how to react to, to whatever challenges. Being a self-confident, violent, strong. And and the role that this has for backlash politics. Yeah, the role that it has. Yeah. Mm. And, I think what he means is if, if this is not helping really, you know, the cause yeah. of, of women, right? Yeah. Well, because the model that they present is to just have to behave like a man, right? Or mm. like a role model for, for man heroes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's another relevant point that I haven't doubt in the, in the talk, but I think is very important. And it regards the stereotypes, no? which are the stereotypes that are linked to femininity and the stereotypes linked mm. to masculinity. And uh, there's this kind of um, a contradiction because on the one hand, we've got uh, women mobilizing in the world saying, okay, um, why do we have to become men to, to, to get better on the one hand? Then on the other, there are some uh, movements saying, no, I don't want to become a man. I want to be uh, a, a woman with my identity, uh, with my feminine identity. And then there, is, there are some others who said, no, um, uh, there is no such a thing as identity. You can be born uh, as a woman, but uh, not, do not need to, to have hmm. clear uh, fem feminine... Clear borders, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so... I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that the whole time uh, 
politicians from right, radical right wing are playing with that, as you said before, because mm. it's a very intelligent strategy mm. and you can simplify things very easily. Mm. So, yeah, of course, um, a woman who is strong, uh, yeah, you can, you can use this discourse of, uh, oh, they are these kind of arrogant women, no? Mm. What do they want? Uh, they have everything. What do they want? They want to destroy the, the country, you know? These mm. this kind of discourses are, uh, are there, of course, and yeah. Mm. Mm -mm. Okay, here goes another one. Um, Marek, um, I have the impression that gender equality research limited only to the relationship between women and men is important. But the more important problems we see in the situation of LGBT IQ people in Central Europe, this is a tragic situation. Discrimination, suicide of young people, attacks on the streets. Shouldn't the assessment of gender equality also cover the LGTB situation? If we ignore this problem, we are investigating sex equality rather than gender. Gender is probably a broader concept. Hmm. Well, he's making a statement more than a question, right? But yeah. I, I, no, if you want to no yeah, I mean this this is directly linked with what we were talking before no this yeah. um, this discussion which is a relevant one and uh, honestly I'm not uh, uh, <laughs> I don't feel like I see um, like the right response uh, is true we've got sex on the one hand and we've got gender on the other mm. and uh, we all know that gender is a social construction uh, and that uh, uh, this construction is linked to the roles that uh, feminine identities should develop in society and masculine identities should develop in societies. So, of course, all men or women who do not attach to such identities are suffering because, you know, uh, they will be punished for not behaving the way they are supposed to behave. So yeah, LGTB and uh, trans are, and all these uh, collectivities are of course uh, being treated really badly in, in some countries. And uh, yeah, I was mentioning Poland or Hungary and the mm. situation is really tragic. Mm. And, and I agree, um, perhaps, yeah, I haven't mentioned it enough in, yeah. in my talk, but uh, yeah, we've, we've got you know, limited time, but yeah, I agree. I yeah, agree okay. with it. Uh, Javier, would you like to, to, to read some of the questions? Okay. Yeah, there are very interesting questions from the audience. I, I hope we can pose them all. But, um, well, let, let's start with one uh, from Fernando Carreño that I would like to comment. He asks, uh, what's the role of prevalent religions on this uh, retrograde uh, advance of the past that you were mentioning, Marta? I think that this is a very interesting question because, well, as one can see in the now popular TV show, Miss, Mrs. America, religion uh, played a decisive role in the advance of conservative positions in the 80s uh, after the emergence of second wave feminism. What, what are your, your findings in, in relation to the, to the current backlash? Would you say that ultra conservative religious groups are taking hold of the public sphere? What, what do, what information do we have about the creators of this uh, reactive discourse? Well, to be honest, I'm not a, an expert on this, but of course there is a lot of, of uh, religion and tradition here. I mean, they are all linked. And uh, what we don't know, it, what is their effective power inside these organizations? I mean, what is the, the, the power that uh, group, because they are very sacred, aren't they? They, are, they, they work in silence um, and without making noise. And perhaps they're even providing, you know, resources and uh, support in many different ways. Uh, but I'm sure, yeah, in the book of Aludi, uh, this is clear. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's more um, uh, like, a, mm, not, not really academic, but uh, uh, she uses more like anecdotes. But uh, even with anecdotic evidence, she shows no, how, how um, certain conservative, ultra-conservative uh, uh, religion groups are affecting and are, and are also providing uh, economic support to uh, conservative parties. 
Uh, but to be honest, I haven't done research on that. But I think it's a, it's a very promising line of, uh, of research. The yeah, connection, but, no, between... Yeah, because particularly, uh, if I may interrupt you just a second. No, absolutely, yeah. Because, um, you know, um, um, from the time on when Islamic groups are um, starting to be treated as groups who have rights that are based on religion, why not? recognize the same, you know, for the majority groups, right? Mm -hmm. So why make an exception to our secularized uh, discourse with, with uh, Islamic minorities and not with uh, Catholic minorities or Protestant ones? Yeah. And I think it has uh, a lot to it. I mean, it, it, it's congruent. <laughs> and so in that sense, I mean, they're taking advantage precisely of all the exceptions that we have been making of our let's say, secularized principles. So in that sense, you know, I think Habermas has studied some, some, some of that. In that sense, we, we, are, we have become indeed post-secularized societies. Mm -hmm. The sense that religion is playing, a, um, you know, a more intensive role in the, in the public sphere. And it's increasing, you know, as, as if compared as 20 years ago, 30 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because of these new, new, new migrants, you know, that come with the religion that have a strong religion as well, right? Mm -hmm. and so so in, in, at schooling and everything, religion plays, plays a, a, quite an important role. And that has consequences for the position of women, of course, right? Yeah. So mm. women, you know, Islamic women uh, don't have to make, um, don't have to make sports together with, with Dutch women, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. And things like that. So, and why not make exceptions with Catholics when it comes to that, right? So, yeah. So I think it's, it's um, no, it's interesting. I think it's, mm. it's an interesting point. Now, Javier, yeah, do you is. have more? Um... Yes. Um, well, I would like to pose one question of my own because the last uh, few years we have seen a, a proliferation of in the number of the so-called influencers, inf influencers in, in social media uh, that disseminate uh, anti-feminist messages. These, these streamers uh, perform small videos and interviews supposedly showing how people are wrong about, about uh, gender inequality. Um, frequently, I think that these videos show a shocking degree of manipulation in relation to the conceptual frames they use or the data they, they use, but uh, they are very popular in the algorithms uh, of digital platforms. So um, your presentation has clearly proven uh, that many of the claims they make are not backed by, by data. They are manipulation. Uh, but, um, but even if we assume that most of these videos are fact-checked, one has the impression that the message uh, remains uh, there in the, in the public sphere, particularly because many people won't take the time to contrast the opinions of these YouTubers uh, with, with other opinions. So how, how would you propose to, to challenge this, this phenomenon? Would you say that it, the solution has to come from media and digital platforms or can public policies do something and, and as well? And, and also, do you think that academics uh, as, as are being effective in reaching the, the general public to, in order to enlighten the, the debate, the political debate? No, that's, that's a very... Uh relevant topic, I think, because as, uh, as we were talking before, um, these kind of uh, videos and uh, news, no, online things uh, are very popular because, um, uh, yeah, they know how to communicate and they do it very well. Uh, but, but at the same time, they are manipulating facts. So that's why, you know, in the field of political science, there is um, this subfield of uh, gender and politics who, you know, tries to get ahead of the level of feminism, which there is nothing bad about it, of course. And the majority of those who are doing gender and politics are feminists, but this is something personal, okay? So uh, gender and politics, what it studies is you know, the objective obstacles that women have to face uh, when they want to get involved in things in society, politics mm. or economic activities, okay? And um, it is really important to do this kind of research because uh, you need to, s to show the facts. And then uh, these facts are those who, you know, uh, say, okay, this is not what you're saying. 
The problem is that disseminating facts is much more boring. And uh, it doesn't create audiences. Mm. Um, so that, that's, that's the, main, the main issue. So one, they, for sure, we need some kind of uh, um, compromised academics who tries to use social media to disseminate this kind of uh, findings. But it's, it's really difficult to, to, to do it nowadays, I think. It's, um, uh, we need more ideas to counter, um, no, uh, to, to make a kind of a counter argument against all these uh, uh, easy discourses about. Um, mm. yeah. Here's another question which I don't quite understand. Maybe, maybe you do from Susana Pozzolo. Um, how do you think about the political impact of the different women's perspectives represented by the words radical and sameness? Radical um, So why do those, those two words represent? So what, what, uh, what's the political impact of, of whatever they represent, radical and sameness? I'm sorry, I have no idea about them. Radical and sameness, no. I don't know what, what she means. Which I, are, is, is a social movement or is a Radical feminism and sameness. Sameness being, uh, Susana, if you can, if you can clarify it a bit, please. So radical feminism on the one hand, as a model to be similar to men. Oh, sameness, yeah. So which is equality, equality feminism, I guess. Ah, equality so ra feminism. So radical feminism vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, um, feminism of equality instead of feminism of the difference or whatever. Mm. Thank you, Susana. So, so it's like, uh, which is the role of uh, each so what, of them? What's the different political impact, um, <clears throat> depending on whether you use the propositions of radical feminism or, you know, this more equality, feminist mm -hmm. sameness? Yeah. Okay. That's so, what I understood at the end. Okay. <laughs> so if I get it uh, correctly, uh, is um, mm, if this debate between feminist, of, I mean, the, the um, radical feminist in which they link the discourse to this idea of uh, um, um, problem, problematizing and uh, making fussy mm. the concept of gender versus those who um, defend this classic way of Gender equality, which is, okay, there's men, there's women, women uh, uh, have to face a lot of obstacles, uh, and we need to fight against these obstacles. Of course, up to now, uh, I think that um, classic feminism or, or whatever, uh, feminism based on, on, on the concept of gender uh, has been much more, um, hmm, let's say, have had more uh, influence Especially, I think, uh, because this kind of feminism, which is pretty much a Scandinavian feminism, mm. Mm. Uh, have um, uh, obtained the support of the European community. And I think we can honestly say no, that uh, mm. the views of the European uh, Union about gender equality is very much their views. So radical feminism, I think, is, is, is struggling to to, you know, to, um, to make their voice heard and to make their points. Um, and I think it is interesting to, to create a debate and to, you know, and to open the agenda to new ideas and things. I mean, they are not so new, but things that have been there like silent and, uh, and need to get a voice in society. So um, a debate is not in its sound a bad thing. The problem is that when you know radical right wing take profit of such debate and uh, you know manipulate the information in their favor, that's that's the, the hmm. uh, <coughs> my main view, no, about it. Yeah, uh, Javier, this, there was another question by Carmen Ormigos, I think. Uh, do, do you have it? Yes. Um. Yes, she, she asked, um, 
that in, in general quality, we have become familiar to reading percentages that is uh, mainly quantitative uh, equality. However, it is not easy to assess whether uh, quality equality is being achieved or how equality is being achieved in qualitative terms. Would it not help uh, more to increase equality? Well, this, I think that this is the first question, uh, the question between uh, how, how to measure equality. And, and then there is a second question uh, that says that would it not help more to increase um, uh, well, this, this is the first question, and, and, and she also says that, in other words, rather than highlighting the negative, the path still to go, um, if, would it, not, it be, be better to assess positively, positively even if minimal, the, the positive actions that have been achieved? Uh, perhaps, uh, in this way, the opposite reactions of certain political, religious, and, and, and social options would, would diminish. So, so I think that the, one of the questions is how to uh, measure the, 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 the inequality and the other is, is more about the communicative strategy of, of feminism. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with this uh, thing that uh, many instances of um, uh, women obstacles no, uh, need to be illustrated and, and can only be captured through more qualitative evidence. And in fact, the, um, um, the Institute for Gender Equality I was mentioning in, in my talk, uh, they also have a, a, like a section about uh, uh, gender violence. And the majority of the indicators they developed are based on qualitative evidence. But of course, these indicators are not numeric. So that is why they are not included in the index, in the general index. They are discussing thought ways of incorporating it to see the extent to which is there any kind of association between mm. the general level of gender equality in societies and gender violence on the other hand because there is this thesis no that uh, the mm. higher um, the level of equality perhaps the higher the level of reaction no mm. uh, so this this has to be tested yet and um in general, all things that are related to discrimina measuring discrimination, uh, violence, and all these uh, kind of um, obstacles and uh, you know um, threaten that, that women have to face um, need to be measured in a qualitative way. I agree absolutely. I have focused more on the index because this is what we have, mm -hmm. uh, but I agree. And then on the second, the second thing that perhaps I have focused uh, or I have emphasized it too much what um, need to be down rather than what has been down. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but um, uh, there is this tendency to believe that since things are going you know, in progression, uh, you don't need to do anything else. This will arrive naturally, no? This idea of, okay, if women now are getting more or less the same uh, levels of education, and they, moreover, they go more to uh, the university than, than, than boys, then uh, in some years, equality will become, it's, it's natural. But the idea of emphasizing what is to be done yet is, is because this doesn't seem to be the case. No, there are some obstacles that remain and remain and remain, and they are linked to values, traditions that penalize women who do not behave the way they are supposed to behave. Mm. And this explains, for example, the amazing um, segregation, for example, in the fields of studies, no? Mm. Uh, or many other fields of segregation, for example, in work, no? Uh, the majority of women in uh, primary education, for example, teachers. They are all women. And this is because th this is linked to, to, to the traditions. The traditions are very strong and they always remain there. So they can be a kind of um, counter, uh, um, or, or like a force that uh, brings things uh, backward. No? Mm -hmm. So that's why I think it is important to focus on what uh, needs to be done yet. And then, yeah, of course, the frame, the, um, like the radical frame of, uh, of some movements uh, 
It's true, but if you think about it, we had had an example of radical movements, no, uh, before, uh, yeah. to avoid racism, to avoid many other uh, things in society. So, yeah, perhaps uh, radical things now sounds like more dangerous nowadays in developed countries, of course. Um, but uh, but there are things there are things that need to be fixed yet, and uh, and and of course they mobilize for for the cause. Okay, I'll, uh, <coughs> I'll put this, the, the last question, <laughs> <laughs> because it's time already. Um, you know, last time, I don't know if you, if you listened to it, you know, in, in Professor Smirkel's presentation. You know, mm, he no, was, I called him because it was changed, yeah. Well, well, it doesn't, doesn't matter, he was linking, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, the problem for democracy that represents crisis management, you know, like pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> because it introduces things that distort, you know, the ordinary way of dealing with things. Mm -hmm. And you refer to it uh, at the beginning as well, you know, as how the pandemic is having mm -hmm. a, a far more effect on women than on men for mm -hmm. obvious reasons. I mean, and so um, do you think if this crisis lasts, so this would be more or less the question, you know, mm -hmm. maybe perhaps one, two years more, uh, that some of the of the enormous achievements that have been made, you know, mm. in gender equality, can be really um, uh, backlashed, mm. <laughs> you know, in the, you know, in, in the strict sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, so in that sense, you know, um, considering the three possible solutions, you know, the pre, you know, the future. So where are we going to keep us as, as, as we are, you know, to lose or to um, or to uh, or to progress? I think it, it would mean it, um, it would mean lose, you know. Mm. So um, yeah, because you know, in this in the in the private sphere, uh, in the sphere of the intimate, uh, we tend to rescue. Mm. How I mean, and to rescue the, the um, uh, our beliefs and feelings about how things has been working, traditionally, no. So it's like more natural, like that women uh, will will be you know more in charge of things related to to care uh, of the children, to care of the elderly. Not now the elderly because they are isolated, but uh, uh, yeah, that's that's the danger, and that's the danger especially again um, for people who have less resources, because you know for people who. You know, yeah. uh, women and men both work, yeah. and they have enough resources. Yeah, they can even outsource, you know, the the, the service of someone who come and take care of the children, no? But um, but there are people who, you know, lack the resources, or the other thing, which is who is more likely to lose the jobs. Normally, those having less stable jobs, and these are women. And services, yeah. <clears throat> so, so if you lose your job, what you, do you do? You don't take care of the children. If your husband or your whoever uh, is have, I mean, still have the job and is the only source of income at home, so there could be additional traps for women. I think, especially those who have unstable uh, labor careers, and uh, um, because. I insist these traditions keep and are silent, but they are always there, always there. Images, everything, it's always there. And, uh, and I think this is, it's easier to come back to sure. uh, the past than to change things, no? Because there are uh, other people mm -hmm. said, okay, now that also men are at home, they will wake up and they will change and they will be more active and will get more responsibilities. But I'm afraid this is not going the case. Yeah, but it's a marvelous occasion, you know, for um, for an intelligent counter discourse on part of women. Yeah. Now you men know what it means to be locked. At yeah. Home. <laughs> so you want to be emancipated again, and we too, you know, at last, yeah. all of us. Yeah. It okay, Marta, really it's been ambition. it's been highly interesting, you, you know, your presentation mm. and and fascinating, and um, thank you very much for being A here pleasure, again. A pleasure, really. And thank you very much to to all of you for following us. Mm -hmm. As you know, next Wednesday we have a last uh, lecture on part of um, um, a philosophy professor, Carlos Thibault, on this new intolerance, okay. reactive intolerance. Thank you very much. <laughs>